pray. God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, you are our strength and our Redeemer. I pray, O oh God, that my words would not only be mine, O oh God, but yours. Amen. So today is, is Father's Day, and I was thinking about my dad, and he used to take us, we had this creek kind of by our, behind our house, it wasn't, you know, it was a couple blocks down, and there was crawdads in it. I don't know if crawdad is the same thing as a crawfish, I don't know if they are, but it's, I, I don't know, we called them crawdads, but, um, uh, but we, would, <laughs> we would take a fishing line and put a hook on it and get raw bacon, I don't know how sanitary this is, but we'd get raw bacon and put it on the hook, and you'd just dip, you didn't have to have a fishing pole, but you'd just dip the hook down in the water, and the crawdads would just grab onto it, and they wouldn't let go, and you could just yank them out of the water, and you could take them and, uh, and, and, and catch them, and we'd usually throw them back, because they were in a pretty nasty creek, and we weren't going to eat them, but um, one day my dad, my dad caught one, and and uh, it w- he w- had it by its, by its carapace, by the back part of its shell. And, you know, its clampers were just going around, and it was just looking for something to clamp onto. And I look at my dad, and he looks at that, and he goes, Hey, Jordan, watch this. And he holds his finger out, just like straight up. And he just slowly moves his finger ever so slowly to this crawdad's open pincher and holds his finger there, and that crawdad just grabs onto his finger and just clamps down. And my dad just goes, Ah! And he started screaming. <laughs> and he just had this like long, protracted scream. Um, and then he slowly got the crawdad's hand off of his clamp or off of his finger. And he showed me he had this little cut on his finger. And he goes, see what happens when a crawdad grabs you? And I was like, Dad, why did you do that? That, doesn't seem, that didn't seem very smart. And he goes, I don't know why I did it. Just, you know. Never done it before, so I just wanted to see. <laughs> but I learned an important lesson from my dad that day. Don't stick your finger in crawdad pinchers, right? Um, I don't know if he meant to teach me a lesson, but he did. But have you ever done that like what my dad d- did where you do something and you go, why did I do that? You ever had those moments? Why did I do that? And you just don't even know? Or like uh, when, when you're growing up, did your, parents, did your parents ever ask you, what were you thinking? Why did you do that? And, and literally, and you say, I don't know, and your parents go, what do you mean you don't know? Have you ever, what do you mean you don't know? And literally, you don't. Because you just acted so impulsively, you don't know why you did it, right? You're like, I don't know. I just, you know, that was a crayon, and that was a wall. Why not? (laughs) You don't even know why. I mean, honestly, we don't always know why we do what we do, do we? And I mean, it's it's not always a moral thing. I mean, how many times have you lost your keys? Where did I put them? I don't know. Where did they go? Why don't you know? I don't know. It's just confusing. I don't even know. Or like, how many times have you been like looking for your phone or your wallet or your glasses or whatever they were, and they were like in your hand? How did you not notice that? But you don't, you know? Like we, and, and the reality of the situation is we are so complicated, aren't we? People are complicated. We are so complicated that we can do things and not even know why we did them, Right? We can act in ways or say things or, you know, it comes, this is when it gets really bad when you're having a conversation with people or, um, and it happens most of the time when you're with your significant others, when you're the people that you're closest to, right? And you say something you shouldn't have said, right? And then when the question was, why did you say that? And you said, I don't know. I didn't mean to. You didn't mean to? You didn't mean to? But you really didn't because you probably honestly weren't thinking about what you were doing, Right? And so, the reality of the situation is is that human beings are so complicated that the majority of the time we really don't know what we're doing. Isn't that right? Like, like quantify how often in your life you actually are paying attention to what you're doing. And like the other 
80% of your life is just like automatic stuff, right? Which in some ways is good, because if you paid every, attention to like every single detail of what you're doing, it'd be kind of maddening, right? Our, we're pretty good at, at, at just going on autopilot. Right, saying things we're not think, talking when we're not thinking about it, um, uh, you know, doing things we're not thinking about. But where that goes wrong is a lot of times we can do things and not know why we did them, say things we don't mean to say, do things that if we were thinking about it we wouldn't do, right? And it can get away from us, right? It can get away from us. When Paul talks about, you know. Nancy did a good job reading that pretty long scripture, but I wanted you to hear the whole thing, and it's, it's kind of confusing sometimes where Paul talks about the spirit and the flesh, right? Because we're talking about, in this sermon series, about what the spirit does for us, right? What the Holy Spirit does for us. What is it? What does it do for you? Well, you've got to go to this passage where he talks about life in the spirit. What does it mean to live in the spirit? And Paul has an opposition between the spirit and the flesh, Right? And you got to ask yourself, what does Paul mean by the flesh? Because a lot of people, I think, when you, when you kind of read this at face value, it's really easy to interpret this text as, as, as like a lot of people have throughout the ages, where like all of our feelings and desires and physical things are bad, right? And that's just bad Greek thinking because the Greeks had this hang up, they always have, and we have inherited that Greek hang up, um, is, is that. The Greeks, were either, whether they were Stoics or whether they were Platonic thinkers, and many of us are still Platonic thinkers, by the way, um, they believed that the only thing that was good was pure reason, okay? And everything else was just bad, okay? So you've got pure reason and thought, and then like emotions and eating and food and all that stuff, and they just hated to have like, be, they hated that they were physical, they really wanted, like, they really thought that, like, the best thing, if you were a Greek, the best thing to think w w was that, like, your soul would just leave your body and you'd be some kind of ghost somewhere and not have to worry about food or, like, feeling things or touching things or anything like that, right? And as a consequence, the earliest Christian interpreters, when they read this text, they were Greek educated, right? So what happens when you're Greek educated and you read these texts, you bring your education to it, right? And you interpret it. That way, you know, if you've ever read Dante's Divine Comedy, um, what Dante says heaven is, is a bunch of people sitting on clouds, singing and thinking. Because like, that's the only thing he could think of that didn't involve your body, right? That's how, that's how, that's how much is invested in this. That sounds like the most boring heaven I've ever heard of. You know, it's like, thanks, Dante. If that's what heaven is, where we just sit on clouds, I don't really care about going to heaven that much, right? Because he was so caught up with, with what, your, what you could and couldn't do with your body that the only thing he thought that was valuable was sitting on a cloud meditating in the presence of God, right? Which God made our body. So Paul clearly is not talking, like trying to disparage our bodies and our bodily stuff that much because God made them right we have all kinds of desires and we have all kinds of things and on some level those are not inherently evil they can't be right because God made them it would be sadistic okay if God said okay here you have you have this body and you have all these physical needs and all these emotional needs and all these psychological needs but by the way they're all evil I'm going to see how you do with that right that's that's crazy right um, so we got to think about what Paul means when he says flesh, right? What does he mean when he says flesh? Because he's not trying to disparage everything. But there is a part of your flesh that's in opposition to the Spirit, right? Later he talks about putting your mind, like the, you, know, you set your mind on the things of the flesh and that makes you in opposition to God, but when you set your mind on the things of the Spirit, that makes you go in, in God's way, right? And so I think what Paul is trying to talk about is something that psychologists are even talking about today, and, and, and that is that our minds are full of different parts, right? Your brain has lots of different parts, and they're all kind of competing for which one's going to win, 
okay? So like, for example, your brain has like, you know, a, a logical part that will go, you probably shouldn't do that, right? But then your brain also has this more like impulsive part that's like, do it, do it, do it, do it, do it, right? And so just those two parts are always fighting each other, right? When you're always like, you're like, you need that chocolate, right? Chocolate, 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 right? And you're like, yes. And you, you, you start to reach for it, and then your logical part goes, but wait a minute. That chocolate has calories, right? And stuff like that. So, so those, you know, they're, they're at war. And I think when Paul talks about the flesh, I think he's talking about the parts of us, right, that are those more impulsive kind of um, aggressive parts of, of, of our mind. They're the parts of our mind that make us do things that we don't realize we're doing, right? I think that's what Paul means by the flesh. The parts of your mind that will run away from you if you don't watch them, right? Make you do things that you didn't want to do, say things you didn't want to say, do things that get you into trouble, right? That's just a part of you, right? It's not like eating is bad or even chocolate is bad, but if you let your, if you let your chocolate eating get away from you, it can be very bad, right, if you don't watch it. And we know this because in chapter 7, the very chapter before this in, in Romans, because this is what we read today, was from Romans chapter 8, Paul says it this way, right? The evil that I don't want to do, I end up doing. It's kind of confusing, right? But the evil that I don't want to do, I end up doing. And the good that I want to do, I am unable to do. <laughs> Who will save me from this body of death, Paul says. Thanks be to God in Jesus Christ our Lord. And then it continues in chapter 8. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Right? Paul is saying that somehow the Holy Spirit, when, when God comes into us, God helps us with that process. Right? God helps us from getting away from ourselves. Right? So God is combating in us that part of us combating us, that part of us that will get away from us, right? You ever, when, you're, when you have some pain, whether it's emotional pain or sort of trauma or even if it's like physical pain, you ever notice how much it helps when you take a deep breath? Oh, you take a deep breath and you distance yourself from it a second and you give yourself just a second and you see it a little bit differently after that. And you get distance. And then you can see it while being outside of it. And it changes the pain, right? When my dad got pinched by a crawdad, he screamed and then he goes, oh, right? look at that. And the taking of the breath allowed him to get some distance from it. Or what about when you stubbed your toe? You stub, stub your toe. You know how bad that hurts? Man, it hurts so bad. And you stub, my toe, my pinky toe has been broken too many times and it sticks out in a weird angle and so it catches doorposts all the time. And I'm like, oh! And you know, and I take, I take, I take, I take, it hurts so bad. And you just have to go, oh, and take a moment. And take a deep breath and you collect yourself. And when you collect yourself, it doesn't make it stop hurting, does it? But you are able to see it in a different way. It, it is almost like seeing it from the outside. And that changes everything. That changes everything. Right? I think that is precisely what Paul is saying here, that the Spirit helps us do. Right? It's because Spirit of God is breath, like taking a deep breath, taking a step back, and saying, oh... I see my pain, I see myself, I see everything in a different way now, right? You take a step back? Because if we don't take a step back, we're going to get caught up in all the emotions and all, the, which, in all the stuff that's going on, all the pain, and we can run away from ourselves, can't we? If we don't watch ourselves. But the Spirit allows us to take a step back and go, oh, well, look at that. 
I see things in a different way. And that's because the Spirit is something that comes from outside of us and then is inside of us. It allows us to view ourselves in a different way from the third person. Did you, it's a crazy ability that you have that you can imagine yourself sitting here in this pew, can't you? You can imagine yourself sitting here in the pew. You can see yourself from outside of yourself. That's crazy. And that allows you to interact with the world in a different way. When you're going through like the, the most trauma or the most pain in your life, you lost someone you love, you're, you're, you're sick, or you're, you're worried about your kids, right, or something like that, think about all those worries that just build up. And doesn't, isn't that what happens? It becomes a cycle like an avalanche, like a snowball. All the worries and stuff, they, they add up, they add up, they add up. And pretty soon, you're like Sisyphus pushing this boulder up a hill of all your worries. And you just know, you just know this boulder's going to roll right back over you. It's about to happen. I'm worried about it, I'm worried about it, I'm worried about it, I'm worried about it. And we'll just break ourselves all to pieces, won't, don't we? You've been there where you just make a crisis of all the stuff that you're feeling all at once. But when you take a breath, like the Spirit allows you to do, you step back and say, okay, this hurts, there's a lot of stress, there's a lot of worry, but I see it differently now. What's the next step? Right? That makes all the difference in the world. Let me ask you a question. Would you rather be in the washing machine? When you put, when you put all your clothes in the washing machine, you turn it on, and, you, and it goes, would you rather be in it? Or would you rather be outside of it, washing the clothes get washed? Which one? You'd be right outside. The Holy Spirit allows you to be outside of the washing machine, y'all, and watch yourself and watch all those things go around so you can take a breath and be a little bit removed from them instead of being inside of it all the time. That's one of the things that the Holy Spirit allows you to do. It allows you to escape from yourself. It allows you to get outside of yourself and get over yourself and move on. Because when you zoom out and you get outside of yourself and you can see yourself, guess who you can also see? Other people. Which is who we're supposed to be loving anyway. When you zoom out, as the Spirit allows us to do, take a deep breath, you don't have to be caught up in all the stuff that's going on in your life. It's still there. It doesn't make it go away. But you can deal with it. Because you can see it from a distance. It's the difference between if I'm being attacked by some guy, I'd rather him be way over there than right in my face, right? If I'm being attacked by my problems and my worries, I'd rather them be way over there than right in my face. And so when I step back, I give myself some distance and I can deal with them. And then when I zoom out in my peripheral vision, I can see all of you and I can see everybody else and that allows me to care for people in a new way. That's one of the things that the Spirit does for us. It's this power that comes from the outside, comes inside. Allows us to see things in a new way. I remember uh, it was a couple of years after the, the crawdad incident with my dad. And uh, we were jumping on the trampoline and I fell off of it and it hurt really bad. And uh, my dad was out in the yard, you know, doing yard work. And what was my instinct? My instinct was to run to him. I didn't know what he was going to do or how he was going to fix it. I just knew that he was there and he was the guy to go to. Right? And I was panicking. I was in pain. I was like, my leg, my leg, my leg. You know how kids get when you're doing that... <laughs> kind of crying where you can't even breathe, you know, and my, and my dad, my dad goes to me, and he's all covered in grass because he was mowing the lawn, and, and I, I, I just laid down right next to him, I was like, my leg, my leg, because I couldn't even, and my dad goes, take a breath, how can you be so calm, dad, how can you be so calm, this is the end of the world, but my dad says to me, take a breath, breathe, can you move your toes? Yes. Yes, I can move my toes. Then they're not broken. You're okay. That's what he said. 
<laughs> he used to be a trainer in high, in, in, when he was in high school. They're not broken. You're okay. And it sounded kind of, I wanted a little more than that, you know, as a, like, make my suffering okay. But what did my dad do? He gave me some distance from myself, right? He gave me some perspective. He added his years of perspective to things. He had seen hurt feet before. He knew it wasn't serious. He told me to take a breath, step back, and to view. He imbued me with his distance. And I was able to see it in a different way. And it changed the way, it literally changed the way I felt about my injury. It didn't make my pain go away in my foot, but it changed the way I felt about my pain. And that makes all the difference in the world, right? It's the difference between panic. And despair and hope and peace, right? That's what the Spirit does. It's Father's Day. And Paul, at the end of this chapter, says that God sent the Spirit of Christ. It goes inside of you, lives in you, and then what does it cry out inside of you? Abba, Father. Abba is the Aramaic word for daddy. It's not just dad. It's daddy. The Spirit of God is inside of you. And it's crying out, daddy, daddy. He says that's what adopts you into the family of God. You relate to God in fundamentally the same way that Christ related to God. That's a big deal. But that's what gives you that distance. What allows you to take a breath. Allows us to step back and see ourselves see others, our pain, our joys, our triumphs, all in a different way. The Spirit of God inside of you is like Daddy mowing the lawn when you get hurt, that you can run to at any time, always crying out, Abba, Father. And the Father looks down on us and says, take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. You may be broken, but you're not destroyed. That's one of the things the Holy Spirit does for us. And that's why we gather around this table every Sunday. We gather around this table to think about God, our Father. We think about the Spirit of Christ which lives in us and cries out, Abba, Father, which allows us to take a breath and give us some distance from all that flesh that's going on inside. This is where we find peace. In the body and the broken blood, in the bo- broken body and spilt blood of Jesus Christ, who cries out from us, Abba, Father. We- Father's Day, I pray that you will all go knowing that the Spirit of Christ lives inside of you. The very same Spirit that was in Jesus Christ is inside of you, crying out to the Father. And so that means that we do not have to be swept away. We do not have to live in the washing machines of our souls. We can stand on the outside and watch them go around. We have some distance. We have some perspective. So we can watch ourselves and we can see others. Go in peace to love and to serve. And may your ears ring long with what you have heard. And may the bread on your tongue leave a trail of crumbs to lead the hungry back to where you are from. Have a wonderful week and happy Father's Day. Pray. God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts would be acceptable in your sight. Oh God, you are our strength and our redeemer. I pray, God, that my words would not only be